Der europäische Kolonialismus, meine Damen und Herren, gehört zu den Themen, die am längsten als weiße Flecken in der Aufarbeitung unserer Geschichte bestehen blieben und bis heute bestehen bleiben. Die Erinnerungslandschaft an den Kolonialismus ist eine Art Flickenteppich, der sich nur langsam zu einem Gesamtwerk zusammensetzt. Und dabei, wir haben es heute an vielen, vielen Stellen schon gehört, bergen die Folgen des Kolonialismus massiven politischen Sprengstoff. Also, welche Antworten hat Europa auf den Kolonialismus. Welche Form der Aufarbeitung und Entschädigung ist angemessen und wer prägt eigentlich bis heute den Diskurs über, das, über Europas koloniale Vergangenheit? Das sind die Themen, die wir jetzt in unserem letzten Panel für heute diskutieren wollen und wir freuen uns auf unsere Gesprächsgäste. Rebecca Nana Ayabia Clark, die aus Ghana stammt und sich in Großbritannien als erfolgreiche Verlegerin afrikanischer und karibischer Literatur einen Namen gemacht hat. Pankaj Mishra, Essayist, Literaturkritiker und Autor aus Indien, der in Indien und in London lebt, in Deutschland einem breiteren Publikum vielleicht bekannt geworden durch den Europäischen Buchpreis ähm, den Leipziger Buchpreis zur europäischen Verständigung im Jahr 2014 und Jürgen Zimmerer, Historiker und Afrikaforscher, der aktuell in Hamburg die Forschungsstelle Hamburgs postkoloniales Erbe leitet. Es moderiert Tina Mendelssohn, die manche von Ihnen vielleicht aus dem Fernsehen aus der Sendung Dreisat Kulturzeit kennen. Bitte sehr. You would sit here, you would sit there, you would sit here. Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Das koloniale Erbe, Spielarten und Spätfolgen europäischer Expansion. Vor einigen Tagen erklärte die Bundesregierung der Beschluss des deutschen Parlaments, den Armeniermord Genozid zu nennen, sei rechtlich nicht verbindlich. Nach dem Motto, das Parlament kann viel sagen. Die Gründe liegen in der Realpolitik oder vielleicht auch, wie die Financial Times schreibt, die Zeiten, in denen der Westen tun kann, was er will, nähern sich dem Ende. Ich übersetze mal aus dem Originalartikel der Financial Times in Englisch. The Easternization of economic and political power suggests that the years of uncontested Western primacy are coming to a close. Pankaj Mishra, would you agree? Um, I think with some reservations, um, especially since it's in the Financial Times. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, perhaps the important word there is uncontested, because Western supremacy in, in, in a range of <coughs> areas um, remains and will not be uh, overturned. Um, is that not working? Um, it, won't be, it won't be overturned for a long time, for a long time to come. But what has certainly started to happen, uh, especially in the intellectual realm, is um, other narratives are being proposed by people in, uh, outside of Europe, people in the non-West. Um, the stories that Europeans and Americans have told themselves about the history um, they are being contested, they are being challenged. So I think the, the, the most important realm in which Western supremacy is being challenged today is the intellectual one. In many other realms, military, economic, that supremacy remains and will remain for the conceivable future. Our panel is, has the word European expansion in it. Is it at all, is at all a European answer to colonialism possible? Because Europe was at the time of colonialism such different entities. I mean, the British Empire, the Brits just decided to Brexit, uh, but um, I mean, the British Empire, the Belgians, the Portuguese, the Germans, um, can, one, can one give a European answer? Well, I think, you know, if you look at it from the perspective of um, someone in Africa, when the Europeans were arriving there or in Asia in the 19th century, there didn't seem a whole lot of difference there between uh, say, people from Britain or people from France, um, indeed, if you're in Africa, from Germany. So uh, I think, you know, 
there is a need, there is a great need to acknowledge that particular history and not just insist on, you know, at this point on particular historical differences and how do we uh, deal with this collectively. The fact is that, you know, Britain and France, which were the leading colonialist powers from Europe in the 19th century and indeed the early 20th century, have done the most shoddy, miserable job of acknowledging their imperialism, uh, which continues to taint the way they look, think about the present. I think Brexit, you could argue, is, is very much uh, definitely an indirect consequence of a certain kind of thinking which is you know, very much connected to a certain imperial confidence, uh, a fantasy, myth-making about empire. Uh, this myth of isolation, this myth of self-sufficiency, that's very much rooted mm -hmm. in uh, their possession of, of, of empire. And the fact that they haven't acknowledged that history, uh, the fact that that history was, for many other people, a history of primarily of violence and suffering, means that uh, Britain is really deeply disconnected, not just with Europe, but with you know, many different parts of the world today. And, and, with and, and with France, we are seeing right now in front of our eyes, the consequences of France's failure to, to, to reckon with its colonialist past uh, in the way it is now dealing with its minorities. Um, we, we can see now the, the dark shadow of its colonial past on that. Nana Clark, you are a pioneer. 40 years ago, one can argue, there wasn't uh, African literature in the Western world. And you took actually, you ha your life, you dedicated your life to bringing it into our realm. And um, um, would you say that things ha are profoundly changed today? I would like to thank you all for coming, but also to thank um, the Keba Foundation before I answer the question. Um, Post-colonial literature, you're right, 50 years ago was virtually unheard of in the West until Heinemann brought the African Writer Series where I worked as an editor for 12 years. Um, and I think this history of writing from Africa really is about reading Africa, reading itself of uh, uh, colonial domination and post-colonial mismanagement and corruption. And I think those battles are still very much with us today, but in different, you know, formats. Um, one of the things I want to really focus on is representation in books. And I want to do that very, very briefly by using um, two books that I think epitomizes Europe's way of looking at Africa. Uh, this is a very, very famous book that was published by the Women's Press in 1998. It went on to win uh, the Commonwealth Prize and a lot of other prizes. It's become a classic in the African literary canon. And this was a cover that was put on it when it was published in 1998. I was appalled when I first saw this book. And I remember thinking that one day I would like it to says, publish, it to says republish nervous it. conditions. Nervous conditions by a Zimbabwean writer called Titi Dangarengba. It's one of the best books I have read in my, my lifetime. But I was, I was just really appalled by the, the image of the African girl. The protagonist in the novel is an intelligent, feisty, uh, very, very, uh, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? She is somebody who knows her mind and speaks her mind and is not afraid of, you know, being cowed by patriarchy. And I was actually quite appalled, as I said, wanted to, I remember thinking one day I would like to, to rework this book and put a new cover on it. Be very careful what you wish for, because in 2002, I was made redundant by Heinemann and I started my own publishing house. One of the first things I did was to reissue this book. And you can see the difference in the two covers. This is how I see Tambu, the protagonist, and this is how the women's press see Tambu. I think you can see what I'm trying to say. I think the idea of treating African or African characters or African people as, you know, oddities, as uh, exotic oddities still very much prevail in the European publishing houses today. And going back to things that Chinua Achebe 
who is regarded as the father of modern African literature, has this famous part with Conrad, Joseph Conrad, about his book. You know, you know that famous book? Oh. Huh? The Heart of Darkness. Yeah. And if you Google The Heart of Darkness and Chinua Achebe, there's a whole lot out there. In fact, Chinua Achebe said that his work is important because he's an important writer. His work is used in curriculum for study and for him to, to epitomize, to represent, to create Africans uh, the way he did, he called him a thoroughgoing racist because I think, you know, what I would like to say is most of the time people in these publishing houses uh, are probably not aware that they're being racist, but what they do is deeply racist. And if you say that to them, they would feel very offended. But Chiro Achebe was in a position to say that Conrad was a thoroughgoing racist. Nana, we are still talking a little later about how, uh, when you want to call it that way, the white world or even we in Germany think we can talk about and for the others, but I would like to ask Jürgen Zimmerer, first of all, um, 2014, the city of Hamburg decided to confront itself with its colonial past and put you in charge of doing this. So um, you say it's, um, you, you have been in the media very much for um, talking also about the uh, reparation claims that the Hereros have to the German, uh, brought to the German government, you have said we should pay. Um, why, why, do you, why do you think so? It's, it's something that has happened in 1904. Um, why do you think it's important that we confront ourselves and pay? Well, I would like to, because it's actually two issues. Uh, one is that I think Europe and Germany and Hamburg in this case should confront its colonial past because the colonial past is a, is a key part of European history and it's, it's a key uh, part of the development of, of European ideologies of, uh, of racism. And we, uh, even the today's crisis, which we heard about earlier on, we can't understand neither the crisis nor the reaction to it without understanding this, this history. So we have to confront it because I think, and uh, it has been something like uh, uh, a good understanding of, of, of the Federal Republic of Germany to deal with its past and with the dark past and confront it. And, and we have to extend this to, to, to colonialism. So that is one, we should confront it and we should recognize it as what it's been, like a genocide or, 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 or racism, a racial state, etc., etc. And I mean, if that's not to, to become a, a meaningless gesture, we have to draw conclusions from it. We have to confront the injustice which, which is caused by it. And the example of, of the Herrero uh, is that, you know, the, 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 the social, the, or the, the, the economic fate of the Herrero people up to today is determined by the war of 1904 to 1908. The fact that the Herrero who basically owned uh, the land in central uh, Namibia are no longer owning the land is, is a, a governmental act by Germany from 1906. In 1906, the German government decided that the, as they called the so-called tribes of the Herero are dissolved and all their land confiscated and subsequently that was uh, sold or given away to, to, German, to German farmers. It's, it's now no, only German farmers or South African farmers. It's, it's, it's slowly changing. But you know, the fact that the land changed hand is a consequence of, of colonialism. And if you don't want to have a meaningful, meaningless gesture of saying, oh, we regret our history, we have to find a way of dealing with that. And that will include some way of, of, of you can't repair mm. the damage or the, or, 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 or the, the you know, the suffering, but you can at least help to, 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 uh, to with the consequences. Mm. Half of Britain's, half of, of, of the people in the United Kingdom think that the British Empire was a, a positive, or they have a positive image of the British Empire. 
and uh, when you the the Hamburg um, Merchant um, Chamber had its 350th birthday and put out a very fancy book and um, it the colonial crimes of its members were described in a rather kind of cynical and amused way you said that we Germans suffer from a colonial amnesia why do you think that is well I mean I, th I, th I think that it's slowly changing now but the fact that Germany lost its first colonial empire already in 1919, I'm personally talking about the second colonial empire between 1939 and 1945 40, in Eastern Europe, but we lost the, the first colonial empire, the colonial empire in Africa and, and parts of Asia, meant that in, after 1945, we were sp Germany was spared you know, the, 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 the wars and, 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 and the discussions in the other European countries about, about decolonization. And at the same time, all the energy was sort of uh, used up for confronting the, the crimes of, 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 of the Third Reich, the Holocaust and, 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 and the, 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 the war of annihilation in, in, in Eastern Europe. And that way, <coughs> the, the, the Germans or the German public forgot or pushed aside the, the knowledge about, about uh, colonialism. And this is now slowly changing because I think for, 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 for two reasons. Because one is that globalization confronts us in a different way. Globalization has uh, been with us for quite a while, but now we are also feeling the, 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 the negative consequences, you know. Uh, being it the refugees literally coming to our doorstep, being it Chinese in, or other in, uh, Indian or whatever, in Brazilian investors investing here, jobs going to these emerging economic powers uh, globally, and how we, 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 a lot of people feel threatened and ask, oh, where does this globalization come from? And the, 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 the history of globalization is the history of European colonialism. The, glo the globe, the global, the globus was coming about when, when the globe was circumvented and, and uh, circumnavigated and, and, and colonialism sort of uh, created yeah. the, the, the global world. And secondly, I think that the reality, the demographic reality of Germany, at least in the big cities, is uh, in Hamburg, in Berlin, in Frankfurt, 40, 45% of all the people under the age of 18 have a so-called migrant background. And a lot of them have family ties either to colonies, as colonizers, or as colonized, or have, have an experience yeah. of colonialism and are, are interested in this history. When you say globalization, in 2050, the West will be 5%. But when the Deutsche Kulturstaatsministerin, the German Minister of, um, of Culture, uh, said when the, she talked about the Humboldt Forum, which will be a big place in the, in the, in the middle of Berlin, in the, in the former um, castle, that um, one should research and talk about the crimes of colonialism in the same way that one has researched and talked about the Jewish or the, the crimes against, uh, against Jewish people and, um, and, and the, the things one has stolen from them and the atrocities one has done to them. Is that, is that a sign of, of our changed times? Well, in a way it is. I mean, I think it's important to look at the two uh, as deeply connected to each other. You mean the Holocaust and... And the Holocaust colonialism. and imperialism. Uh, I mean, there's been for, 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 for many decades now a whole lot of evidence about how fascinated um, Hitler was, for instance, with the British Empire, how much he wanted to imitate uh, what the British Empire had done in different parts of the world. The difference was he ended up doing it in Europe, which, you know, uh, which was simply unacceptable. Now, if he had done it elsewhere, that would have been absolutely fine with everyone. Um, now, <laughs> the other thing, the other, the, the other thing to be noted, uh, which is that Africa and Asia, Hannah Arendt, among many others, uh, Simone Weil, and so many people have pointed out that Africa and Asia were essentially laboratories, you know, for the extreme experiment, starting with the concentration camp, 
that were then finally conducted in Europe. So there are very deep connections with what happened in outside of Europe in the 19th century, and then also what happened right in the heart of Europe. So I think when people are taught, as they are in this country, and you know, Germany has made ex extraordinary uh, has made an extraordinary effort to acknowledge that part of its history, which is the second colonial empire, and the crimes committed during that process. But it really is baffling to me how it has failed to reckon with the crimes of the first empire because they are deeply related to each other. I would have to give, before I ask Nana, I would have to give that to you because uh, you maybe have an answer to that. Why is that? I mean, I mean this, I, I think that part of, the, uh, of this German dealings with, with its with its uh, uh, violence in in the in the in the, in, in the Third Reich was to sort of uh, uh, separate the history of the Third Reich from German national history proper, you know, to say that you know outside really right wing circles you will have nobody arguing that the Third Reich was a good thing. So the real debate is about where does it come from. Does it start in 33, or are there deeper connections to, 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 to German history? And the, the, this colonial dimension of, of the, 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 the war in Eastern Europe uh, in, in World War II is one of this, uh, uh, one of this connection. That's why it's so, so disputed and, 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 and so, so controversial to say uh, about, even about the Herero genocide, because you can blame the Hitler for a lot of things, but you can't blame him for the Herero genocide. So it can't be all put on, uh, on, on this Austrian. So it, uh, there is a, 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 well, we have to explore where this comes from. And also, sorry, may I interrupt? Sure. Also, the country we, we don't really associate so much with imperialism, uh, but Italy, which all through the late 19th century was desperate to get an empire. In fact, Italy suffered the, uh, the humiliation of, of losing to Ethiopia in 18, 18, 1896, I think it was. Um, and that was, a, you know, for the first time that a European power had lost to, uh, 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 to, to an African country. But that is also not connected to what then happened uh, under Mussolini in, 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 in Italy. And there's a very direct, strong connection there between this lust for empire, the scramble for Africa. The Italians even wanted to have a base in China, and they were rejected. The Germans got one, uh, the Italians were rejected. Um, so there was always these very deep, profound connections between the late 19th century, scramble for Africa, and then what happened in Europe in the early 20th century. Nana, I would like to bring the discussion a little bit to today. I know that in the discussion you had before, you talked about um, the Bukini and you talked about religion, but before when we met, when we said hello outside, I complimented her on her, on her dress. I said what a lovely dress she has on and she explained that she took it, she put it on um, in purpose uh, and uh, we discussed a little bit the Bukini um, scandal in Nizza is that a colonial act? I think it's a deeply colonial act. I decided to wear an African outfit today because it is my way of affirming my Africanness and saying this is who I am and this is what I am. And I think it's my response to the growing uh, negativity and really harsh treatment of people who are not European, people who are not white, people who are from other cultures, who live and work and contribute to European uh, economies. Uh, Brexit is a point in, 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 uh, in this discussion. In Britain, there's been an increase of people being attacked um, openly, and I think Brexit has kind of given uh, English people, not all English people, some English people, the, 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 uh, the freedom to, to express their racism openly. I think we have to be mindful of the fact that people who are not like us, who don't dress like us, who don't look like us, are human beings just like us. I think, for me, that is a human rights issue. To stand on a woman on a beach and ask her to take a close up, not one, not two, but three policemen, I think it's an inhuman act that should be objected by all mm. right-thinking 
Europeans, not just Europeans, but people from all over the world. And I want to say that I come from Ghana. We have a lot of Europeans in Ghana. We welcome them. We live with them. We love having them. And nobody, I mean nobody, uh, bothers them about the way they dress or what they do in their homes. I think we have to look at the broader picture of looking at these issues as human rights issues. The same way I argue against female genital mutilation, which is an old and horrible practice from Africa, I say it is not about uh, culture, it is about human rights. No. It's a female human right to do with her body what she wants. Just like I have today, dressed in an African outfit to say to you all, this is who I am. I am a proud African woman, and I want you all to see that. But also, it is trying to look the other way to people who have had to deal with attacks and, and just unpleasantness because of the way they look, the way they dress, and that permeates everything else we do. As you know, I'm a publisher. If you look at the publishing landscape and you look at the kind of narratives, the kind of books that go into our curriculum, and that is where I was trained, my background is in educational publishing. It is one of the most important aspects of publishing because what we do when we recommend books to students to read, we're shaping the future consciousness of societies, of individuals, of men, women, and the future leaders of our generations. So if we don't get it right and have people like me in publishing houses to say these images you put on these covers does not represent Africa, this is an exotic representation of Africa. It is so important, I'm passionate about the fact that what we put into our books as writers, as commentators, as individuals, it's very important that we're careful not to dehumanize others while we yeah. feel we Nana, have to do what we do. Do you think that... Do you think that continues in a way, that idea that we can actually speak for them? In the German media in Die Zeit, there were on the front page two women, women writing about the Bukini scandal. One was for kind of the, it's okay to wear a bikini and that should be fine. And the other one was saying why from a feminist point of view it's not okay. But two, the two were white German women. And it seems there is not a single woman that could be asked who is Muslim or who even considers wearing her burqa a good thing. So is that a continuation of, of, of what you actually talked about in, in, in Cambridge? You said in the last, in, in 2015, you had a speech in Cambridge and you said that it was white people deciding what the West is going to read, what, what the West, what we read about Africa. It's the same thing. It is exactly the same thing. It's objectifying people. It would be good to have a white person and maybe a Muslim person to have a discussion to, to find out how each person feels about, you know, the, the burkini question. But we always find that Europeans or white people validate us. They validate what we read. They want to validate what we wear. They want to validate what we think. They want to validate what we see. I think that is wrong. I think it is wrong because what it creates is a hierarchy of, of, of knowledges, hierarchy of uh, intellectualism, hierarchy of what we don't know, because we're European, what we don't know is not worth knowing. That is arrogance. I believe is that is real arrogance. And we need to be humble enough to be inclusive. But to be inclusive is to be generous of spirit. We have to have a generous heart to want to include other people who are not like us. And this is something that I want you to think about in everything you do. When you're reading a book, ask yourself, where is this writer coming from? Do a little research about the background. I publish writers from Zimbabwe, from uh, the Caribbean, from my own country in Ghana. I lived in Nigeria. I publish Nigerian writers. How many of you actually know that Africa has produced a Nobel Prize for literature? We have a Nobel Prize for, uh, 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 Wole Shoinka won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1986, before Nadine Goldima, before Koizi, before uh, um, Toni Morrison. 
I mean, this is something that I want to bring to the fore because recently, as last year, July, June, July last year, uh, there was an Oxford professorship of poetry, which Wallace Oinka, the Nobel laureate, uh, wanted to apply for. And there is a history because nine years ago, another black Nobel laureate tried to apply for the same position. And he was, well, he eventually resigned, but there was controversy about the fact that some of the people who were also applying for the same post said that Derek Walcott had tampered with young girls when he was teaching at a university in the US. What came about actually after the investigation was that there was no conclusive evidence to show that he was actually doing that, but he decided to resign. And so uh, somebody else got that. But I want to finish the point very quickly because last year, the same thing happened to Wally Shoinka. Now these are two Nobel Prize winners. If you cannot accept some of our most intelligent, some of our best brains to teach mm -hmm. and try and you know, bring Africa to the world through our highest educational institutions, what, when are we going to be able to include people who are not like us in our narratives in a positive way? Okay, uh, Jürgen, I would like to ask you about your research. I would like to ask how Hamburg, um, the city of Hamburg, the, the companies in Hamburg react to to this enterprise? Are they very happily opening their archives? Is there a lot of enthusiasm? Well, I mean, again, I would like to stress that it's not only about the companies, it's not only about the, the, the merchants. And that ties into what we just discussed. We're also looking at the human zoo at Hagenbeck. We look at, at the ethnological museum because colonialism is not, not only about political domination, or economic domination. It's also about, you know, shaping a world or imagining a world and all this. And that's what, so it's broader like that. Uh, in general, I think there is a certain reluctance with some companies. It depends. There are companies around in Hamburg which existed already in the time of, 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 of the colonial empire. But they, uh, wouldn't, they wouldn't not allow you in. No, they, they did. You, you can't generalize. It depends pretty much on, on who you are talking to and on the, uh, it's a generational level as well. The younger generation is much more open than, than, uh, than, than the older generation. They partially allowed us in. Even the Chamber of Commerce is now opening up uh, uh, the, the, the archive, is seeing that it made, perhaps made a mistake with with the, the, the book you, you, you referred to. But it's not that everybody is welcoming us or celebrating us. It's, it's uh, a, a bit comparable to, to, you know, 20, 30 years ago with, with, uh, with a national, so, uh, with, with a Nazi uh, research. Uh, uh, research into the Nazi past of, 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 of companies. Um, would you say, Pankaj, that we have actually a juridical instrumentarium to deal with this. Do you, I mean, we talk about money. Immediately people say, and the way that the Germans, when we talk about the Hereros, came to Africa, Joschka Fischer then said, well, I'm not going to say anything that you could use in a juridical way to get money out of this. Is this the wrong way? Is this uh, Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's a, it's a complicated issue. Um, I mean, if you were to look at it very pragmatically, there are very few political cultures right now in Europe that will be hospitable to the idea of reparations uh, in the first place. So, you know, they may be politically unfeasible. They may even be politically undesirable at this point because what this kind of thing may end up really doing is uh, fuel the, the hard line extreme right wing agenda at this point. I think there are many ways of um, dealing with that past and just, you know, a simple transaction, um, simply handing over large sums of money. And then the question arises, to whom are you handing that sum of money to exactly? Um, so all kinds of questions are opened up when you talk about money that way. I think, you know, especially as a, as a writer uh, who deals constantly with dehumanizing stereotypes, uh, I think my focus is really on, on, on clearing misperceptions and uh, 
clearing you know, the large areas of ignorance people have about this particular past. It's actually, as you say, you know, it's not about plundering, it's, it's actually about ways of thinking and those need to be altered, those need to be changed. And so at, when we talk about acknowledging the past, we're really talking about how do we also then think about the future, think about the present. And unless you do that, uh, you know, we won't go forward. And I think money is a simple way to relieve your conscience and say, okay, we've done it, we can now move on uh, and, and keep behaving and thinking in the same way. I really think it's important to actually change one's thinking about these things. And I would like to just like to add and, 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 and broaden it a bit because it seems to be a key, uh, a, a key uh, topic which also links to an uh, earlier debate today uh, at, uh, about the refugees and, and about the, 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 the wall. Um, it's not about just paying money, it's about confronting a certain past. And I think that the West or the global North or Europe which we try to define, and, and we had the, the Burkini debate and all this, where we said, we, the West, are enlightened. And I think that is a moral issue. If we want to create the West, we have to talk about what we mean by West or by European values. And if we mean by European values that it's like human rights, etc., etc., then we have to confront the injustices of the colonial past, and we cannot build wars and make them over, uh, higher and higher and higher and say, oh, it's still the European values and we justify it by our values. So we really need a debate about what, we, what European values are, and I think confronting the colonial past. And, and colonialism was a European project. It was a European project, and all of Europe was part, part of this, this, this project then we have to talk about this. And if we don't do this, we should stop talking about European values. Can I interject? Yes, please. I think, I think what uh, Michel said, it's about changing mindsets. It's about shifting the way people have been socialized, schooled to think for generations. It is difficult to shift that mindset, but throwing money at it. I'll give you an example of what happened when the uh, UK is what I know, the slave uh, owners in the UK were paid huge sums of money uh, after the, uh, the abolishment of the slave trade. The slaves, guess what, got nothing. They got nothing at all. And what is even more disturbing is that the slave owners who were paid those huge sums of money are now the people who control the business, uh, 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 real uh, business in the UK, like the big banks uh, uh, and, and the big insurance companies, the railway companies, um, health insurance companies, these were the descendants of slave owners. Mm -hmm. And they were paid in today's money, billions of money. And they now hold the, the, the economic power in the UK. So what you do, what do you do with people who, first of all, benefited from, you know, dehumanizing others, and they've benefited again by holding the power to the economic. How do you square that circle? How, what do we do? You can throw money at it, but I think where to start is what you both have said, is to shift the mindset, the way we are used to thinking. It is comfortable to think that way because it is the way we've always thought. What we're challenging you to do is to start to shift your thinking from what you've always done to thinking about people who may not be like you, but might also be contributing to what we do in terms of the economy, the moral issue, the social issues. And, you know, we can do a lot more. I think we can do a lot more. Would you agree? Is there an alternative to uh, reparations? I mean, the Mau Mau case in Britain has been, uh, they have paid uh, 20 million, or I think they have paid 20 million and have decided to do so in a big court case uh, that uh, the Mau Maus have put against the British government. I think the case of the Hereros is far more complicated. So what can we do? I mean, it is important. And if you talk to, to Herero and Nama, they, they, they say the money, money is important, but it's not the most important thing. And it's, 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 it's about, you know, uh, accepting the historical guilt and doing it in a way which respect the, the descendants of the victims. And that's where we're actually, I think we don't make any progress at all. A couple we of, is the Germans. German government, a, a couple of weeks, weeks ago, the, the Namibian president says that, you know, the way the, the, the German special envoy 
uh, acts or, 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 or in, in, in Namibia uh, jeopardizes the good Namibian-German relations, which is a big, a big statement uh, by, a, by a diplomat. Because they basically said, we come here, we talk to you and negotiate now the, the language and then the reparation, but we have to do it now, and, and, and we have to do it and, and give the, t the schedule and, and the conditions. And they reacted that that's adding insult to injury by coming now, and, and, and in the newspaper somebody wrote, if you, if you come to countries and, and, and you, you exterminate old people, don't come later and, tell us, and even then tell us how to, to deal with it and how to uh, you know, make good. Pankaj, would you say that IS or ISIS is a direct consequence of colonialism? Well, obviously, you know, uh, there's a sort of strong uh, historical connection to the making of unviable states, drawing lines in the sand. Uh, all this happened after the end of the First World War, and suddenly Britain and France had full license to do whatever it wanted after having defeated Germany here. Um, so they did all that and created these essentially um, completely unviable states which could only really be held together by despots for the most part, and that's what the history proved. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, we, we've been talking about imperialist ways of thinking, and one of the direct consequences of that was the invasion of Iraq in 2003. That was pure imperialism at work. That was the imperialist mentality at its most naked. And we saw ISIS is a direct consequence of that. So when we talk about changing the thinking, I think that is much, much more important than handing out bits of money to, to someone in Africa. Uh, because that mentality is still playing a role in today's world. Um, I mean, that an author like the Algerian author Kamel Daoud won the Prix Goncourt last year for the Merceux investigation, which is a response to Albert Camus' uh, L'Etranger, which he has written in, 42, in 1942, which basically describes a, a, a killing of Arabs without giving them names and faces. Is that kind of, in a cultural, in a literary way, a reparation? Is this a way to repair something that has been totally disconnected? to give it a name, to give it a face, to put it, to, to talk to each other via books. It is partly a way to do it, but it's not adequate. I think writers are doing their best to chronicle, to document, to, to make sure that these histories that I'm sure Europe would rather forget are documented for future generations. And I think in that respect, Art has an important role to play. Art is not just for entertainment and for uh, information. It's also about documenting histories, documenting uh, uh, narratives about what happened to communities who were not in a position to defend themselves. It's partly uh, uh, doing that. But I think we have to put more pressure on European uh, countries to do a lot more. And, and we can do that by making sure that people from these former colonial countries are represented in decision-making uh, uh, areas where important decisions uh, that go into education, that go into uh, uh, trade policies, that go into uh, uh, you know, what we do with these uh, uh, former colonies, we need that representation, it's important. And we need the representation as equal partners, not as you were mm -hmm. saying, as people who will be talked down to mm -hmm. and be told what to do. Mm -hmm. The idea is to accept the people that you're dealing with as equal partners. How do we do this, Pankaj? Is it, for instance, Britain does the Black History Month or has the Michael Caine uh, Literary Prize for African and Caribbean Literature? Um, do we have to change our school books? Is it that? I think it's actually the most important thing. Thank you. Um, it's that uh, the way in which uh, people in Britain are taught their history, there's something fundamentally wrong with it, and that's why you end up with I that kind of grotesque uh, figure of 50% people, or at least the people who are asked their opinion on this, saying that the British Empire was a wonderful thing. 
uh, we, we get to this horrible situation because people have not been told the facts very early on. They've been told about how wonderful their fathers and grandfathers were who won the Second World War. And this is largely the history that is being taught to people in Britain to pride themselves on defeating Hitler. Uh, and this is why there is such a strong anti-German, anti-EU sentiment too in, in, in Britain today. So I do think that something is really terribly wrong with the way history is taught. And, and that's where we need to begin. And here? Right. I mean, obviously, I mean, there's for good reason the, the Holocaust and, and, and the Third Reich takes center stage in school. But it has to, the, I mean, the whole colonial dimension has to be added because it's a prehistory, it's a direct prehistory of, of, of the Third Reich. And as far as what, what my students tell me, I always ask it the first week, what do you know about German colonialism? Have you heard it at school or not? And it varies, it depends on the individual teacher. Some know a, a lot, some have said they've never heard about it. And even if they have heard about it, what have you heard about it? So it's, it's, it's key that this enters, enters the schools and, and, and the, the, the school textbooks. Can I and, a word? Yes. I think that's what I've been trying to say about the importance of uh, educational publishing. Because if you look at Britain, is what I know, so this is what I'm going to talk about. If you look at the educational publishing houses in Britain, um, there are no people of color at all. And I think a recent survey said something like 0.5. Well, I would probably put it at 0.1. Uh, because I have worked in the industry for 25 years, and they are not really prepared or welcoming of people, people of color. And unless and until we have representation at these very important spaces, and if you look at that um, paper I did for Cambridge, I titled it Publishing as a Site of Resistance. Publishing is so important. What we read is what we are. We are what we read. And when it comes to the educational sector, you can't get more, you know, it doesn't get more important than that. And I, I like to, you know, quickly say that in Britain, children are taught the glorified history of conquest, wars that were won, but they were, they're not taught about the brutalization of other communities by the colonial empire mm -hmm. and other colonial empires in Europe. I think it should be compulsory reading for schools, absolutely. And also maybe talking about one's own, one's own history and one's own path. I mean, you were born in Ghana, you lost your father, and from the death of your father, Zon, you were not having any formal education. You came to Britain, I asked you when you were 16, and you went to Oxford, and you have a publishing house. So how, how did you do this? Sheer oh, how did determination and, and willpower, really. I think if you want something badly enough, you make the, the, the sacrifices. If you want something that badly enough, you have to make certain sacrifices, and I had to make sacrifices. I studied for six years at the Open University while I was working full time and being a mother and a wife. And that meant I had to get up at 5 a.m. every morning for six years. That takes planning, determination, and just sheer willpower. And so I went on to finish that, and I went on to, to do my, my Oxford degree. I want to say that, you know, Europe has a lot to give its former colonies. And I'm a prime example. You know, I've come from Ghana. I've benefited from European education, but I can see the flaws in European thinking, and I want to help. I want to be a bridge to helping to realizing what Europe can, can, can do for its former colonies. Pankaj, we are coming to the end, and then I would like to open the discussion, but one last point, which is we have in Germany one million refugees. Um, you talk that the European dream seems to work even with people who come from those countries that have been tortured and maltreated by the Europeans. Um, why is that? What, what is this? Well, I think we have to acknowledge that the European dream works because the European success um, was historically built upon the exploitation and plundering of lands in different parts of the world. So let's not forget that connection. Uh, and the reason why so much of the world is falling apart is because they were once exposed to European imperialism. Mm. So we have to, we have to acknowledge that. 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, would you like to ask questions? Yes, please. Got a follow-up question on reparations and the role of education. Reparation is a toxic uh, issue, of course, politically not welcome and legally complicated uh, as well as most victims, at least of slavery, are dead of colonialism not. Um, given that we uh, discuss among a, uh, or with in the format of uh, foundations, uh, the German story of compensating slave laborers in Eastern Europe uh, after the end of the Cold War might be uh, an idea, I don't know, for foundations uh, to tackle the issue of coming to terms with colonialism and dealing with it historically and educationally. Basically, the German government with government money and private money from companies that were involved uh, spent 10 uh, billion German marks at that time, I think, uh, to create a foundation called Remembrance, Responsibility, and Future, and invests heavily into educational programs. I mean, considering such an effort on a European level with the former colonial powers, I don't know, might be an idea. Um, second, uh, that is rather a thought, a question goes to uh, Professor Zimmerer, from a white man to a white man, um, <laughs> mano, mano. which is the, uh, I quote halfway, uh, the way Germans came to terms with the Nazi past and tried to make it into an exotic event, exotization or Betriebsunfall in, in Germany. I don't buy into this argument. I think if you make it politically, yes, but if you really to look into scholarship and into uh, historical work in depth and your trained historian who teaches it, there were so many debates about continuity, continuity of beliefs, continuity of genocide is the new it's kid in problem. town, continuity of, uh, of, of money, of political system. Um, I think that's state of the art 1959 if you make this argument. Uh, 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 yes, please. Okay. Uh, the first thing is, I mean, the, the problem in the, in the, for monetary compensation or reparation, the problem, and that's it, the difference to the, the case you quoted, is that the, 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 the slave laborers in, in World War II, I, I mean, the individuals were alive and did get some money as compensation. In this case, we are talking about there's nobody alive. And, and the, other, the, the big question is, if you are prepared to pay, who do you pay, <laughs> pay to? And even who talks for the communities, which is a, which is, is a, big, a big issue, even a, a problem in the current negotiations with Namibia, because not all the Herero uh, live in Namibia. Because some, as a consequence of the genocide, live in Botswana, so how, who, who, who talks, talks for them? That is just something which, which distinguishes the two cases. Um, well, if, if, if it's so widely acknowledged, all the, you know, I, I know that there, there is a debate about continuities of elites and there is a continuity of anti-Semitism. Why is there not a debate uh, or wasn't there a debate earlier about these racist trajectories, about the colonial trajectories? That is the question. I'm posing, and why did the argument of a, of, of a connection between Windhoek and Auschwitz meet with uh, such heavy resistance uh, by a lot of historians who were not known to be any experts on colonialism at all, but who, who didn't know a thing about colonialism, but were sure there is no connection. And that, I think, is one of, 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 of um, I came up with this, this, this expla ex explanation. And why do you have to talk about normal colonial war? I mean, the main argument of, against the genocide of the Herero and the connection to the Holocaust is, oh, that, that was a normal colonial war. As, as, what is normal about the colonial war? What is normal about the colonial genocide? And why, why do, it, do they really try to, to build up this wall, a mental wall, between the, the colonialism and, 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 and the Third Reich? Please, more questions, yes. Ich muss gestehen, dass ich so ein bisschen zwiespältig dieser Diskussion folge, weil ich auf der einen Seite völlig ihrer Ansicht bin und mich dann zwischendurch frage, ob das nicht eine wahnsinnig abgehobene 
intellektuelle Debatte ist, bei der man sich als Journalistin, die ich bin, fragt, wie ist so etwas vermittelbar? Also wie soll man vermitteln, dass es um Ereignisse geht am Anfang des 20. Jahrhunderts, ähm, für die man Entschädigungen zahlen soll? Das ist also eine ganz sehr ernsthaft gefragte, ähm, also vor allem angesichts einer Situation, in der ich das Gefühl habe, dass man sehr viel mehr Aufmerksamkeit bräuchte für Zukunftsfragen und ich tatsächlich sehr skeptisch bin, ob wir nicht oft uns gerade in Deutschland immer in wirklich Geschichtsvergessenheit und gesch historische Debatten verwickeln, ohne ausreichend über Zukunft und Strategien für die Zukunft nachzudenken. Did you understand? Did you? No, actually, no. Uh, I think that's okay. Yeah. For Tim, well, it's a question for all of us. It's basic. I mean, really. Uh, but uh, Herr Zimmerer, would you like to? Can I tell you in a minute how to how to popularize this? I mean, I, I don't think. Of course, it's an ac academic d d discussion. I mean, that, and, and of course, it's it's uh, it might sound uh, you know of no direct consequences, but that's what academics do. Uh, I mean, think uh, about things, make arguments, and 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 the question of can you is this formidable? Can, can, you, can you bring it to your readers or your viewers? Well, that's difficult. You can't even bring to your viewers that you have to have people who are fleeing Syria. I mean, we are, we are, we are failing, failing there. And that has something about the present, it's something about the future. I mean, if, if we build our identity, as Germany has done after 45, on our ability to critically assess our, our past and to make good for the, the, the racist violence and the racist crimes, then we also have to include this. Or we can as well, I mean, are you saying, let's give up on the Holocaust? I mean, that's 50, 60, 70 years back. I mean, if you're saying that, okay. I'm asking, I mean, I, I think there's a chance, actually, I, I, I think it's a chance in opening up the debate about racist crimes from, from the Holocaust and from the Third Reich to the colonial, uh, colonial crimes allows a l to bring a lot more people, young people, into the discussion. Because all those people educated with a so-called migrant background, or many of them, are much more open uh, about, about, about this question because a lot of them think the Holocaust as, as something which, which has been committed by Germans long before they or their parents. Have, uh, have, have come to Germany. So if you open it up this way, I think it's, it's, it's actually a, 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 a chance. And it, it's, it's addresses, it addresses a key problem of, of, of the future, which is globalization. I mean, the other thing, um, we, we talked about school books, um, educating people from a young age, but I think uh, there's a category of uh, professionals in, Europe and America today who need to be re-educated, and I'm talking about journalists here. Uh, there are a lot of journalists or journalism or Financial Times, like, you know, many, many mainstream <laughs> forums like the New York Times. These people are completely disconnected, many of them, uh, not only from what is happening in the world outside, they're also disconnected from academic scholarship. So they live, they inhabit a very peculiar world. Um, and one reason why mass media, uh, the press in particular, is facing a lot of challenges from the internet, but I think it's also deeply internally challenged. It's challenged from within by the failure of, of, of most journalists to really reckon with history, to reckon with academic scholarship, uh, to, to, to understand that there is a lot of sophisticated knowledge out there, and we just can't have this nonsense of the deep side you know, having, putting two white women together to talk about burkini anymore. You know, that, that the world has changed, we moved on. Um, I, I really do think journalists need to be retrained and re-educated. Okay, with this, we finish our <laughs> discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much on the stage here with all of you. Thank you. Vielen, vielen Dank. Thank you very much to our panelists. Um, I'm not so sure um, whether you've now not left us with a topic for the next conference. I mean, a dialogue between journalists and academics, but that will be subject to another conference. Um,
Wir haben heute am ersten Tag des Körper History Forums viele, viele verschiedene Aspekte der Geschichtspolitik in Europa berührt. Und wir, hat, Herr, Herr Dr. Paulsen hat ja heute Morgen schon gesagt, wir werden, oder hat gestern, gestern Abend gesagt, wir werden nicht alle Fragen ausreichend und tiefschürfend beantworten können. Ich glaube, wir sehen, dass, das haben wir nicht vermocht, aber wir haben, glaube ich, schon vermocht, Debatten anzustoßen und zumindest ähm, Ihnen Food for Thought, wie man so schön auf Neudeutsch sagt, mitzugeben. Und ich weiß, dass es Zeit braucht, um dieses Gedankenfutter äh, zu verdauen und auch noch mal äh, sozusagen weiter zu besprechen mit, äh, mit Konferenzteilnehmern, die Sie vielleicht heute noch nicht ausreichend mit denen sie noch nicht ausreichend sprechen konnten, weil die Pausen zu kurz waren oder weil keine Zeit dafür war. Deshalb laden wir Sie ein um 18.30 Uhr. Das heißt, Sie haben jetzt fast eine Stunde lang Freizeit. 18.30 Uhr zum Abendessen in die Austernbank. Und für diejenigen, die in das Restaurant Austernbank, für diejenigen, die nicht wissen, wo das ist, Sie gehen bitte aus dem Haupteingang des Gebäudes raus und Gleich links die nächste Tür wieder rein, da ist das Restaurant. Bis dahin, bis um halb sieben, haben Sie Zeit, ein bisschen von der Frühabendsonne auf dem Gendarmenmarkt zu genießen. Wir freuen uns auf Sie zum Abendessen und wir freuen uns auf Sie morgen. Um äh, 10 Uhr geht es hier weiter mit dem dritten Tag des Körper History Forums, wo wir uns, und das, da bin ich sehr dankbar für das Panel, Sie haben sehr viel über Schulbücher gesprochen. Wir kümmern uns morgen einen Tag lang um Geschichtsvermittlung. Vielen Dank und einen schönen Abend wünsche ich uns und Ihnen allen. Dankeschön.